brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to you all this morning. I pray that it's a delight for you all to come and meet and worship together. Uh, just one announcement, just a reminder that we are having a men's breakfast on Saturday the 5th of August, so that's in two weeks' time. Um, encourage all the men to consider attending and there'll be an email going out this week uh, as a reminder and if you could just RSVP to the email so we have an idea of numbers for catering. Thank you. Just welcome our own Pastor Andrew to lead us in worship this morning. Well, good morning, congregation. What a blessing for us to be able to gather together and to gather in the presence of the, the Lord our God to worship Him. Our call to worship comes from the psalmist in Psalm uh, 62, uh, where we hear these words. My soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. That's what we've come to, to do the, this morning, to express uh, our trust in the Lord, our God, and to pour out our hearts to him in, in praise and worship and adoration. Let's do that now as we uh, come to him in a time of silent and individual prayer. So I invite you to pray silently and individually. Great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this uh, beautiful invitation for us to come and find rest for our souls in you. Our souls are, are weary with the battles and struggles and difficulties of life, weary with the, the struggle against sin. And so we, we come to find our rest in you. Lord our God, we come to find our hope in you. Uh, Lord, we uh, we know that uh, all the things that we try and put our hope in in this world will fail us, but, but th that you are the God uh, who will never fail us and we can hope in you. Uh, and our hope uh, is in you for, for salvation. Lord, we thank you that you are our rock and our fortress. And as we uh, look to you in faith, we can, we can know uh, that we will not be shaken uh, whatever happens in this life. And, so we, we thank you, O Lord our God, that we can come and uh, have fellowship with you this morning uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would speak to us through your word and that we pray that we might delight to know you and to experience your goodness and your faithfulness as we worship this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. Amen. Congregation, could you please stand? <coughs> And again, as we uh, gather in the presence of the, the Lord, we're reminded of, um, of God's disposition to us, that he, he really does uh, delight in his people, uh, and he's glad that we've come to, to worship him, uh, for he greets his people uh, with joy, saying grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing together uh, the words of the classic hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's lift our voices to sing to our God together.
seat and will you turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Isaiah 6. It's pretty much right in the middle of the Bible and we'll be reading from Isaiah 6 uh, verses 1 through 8. And our brother Eddie will lead us in the readings. So Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Isaiah 6 is one of those uh, Old Testament passages where we get a a clear uh, view of what the the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. And so here we have the gospel, and where does it start? Uh, It starts by telling us about who God is. Who is he? He's the holy God. And it starts by telling us who we are. Uh, We are sinful people uh, in need of his forgiveness. Uh, So let's uh, come to him in in prayer as we confess our sins and seek his pardon and his grace. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we've just read about your holiness. We've read that even the pure and righteous angels in heaven have to veil their faces before your holiness. Uh, We know that you are light and in you there is no darkness at all. Uh, We know that your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. Uh, Lord, you are so unlike us. Every thought, every desire, every word of yours is pure and righteous and holy and good. But we know, Lord, that even though we're people who've been uh, redeemed, uh, we have not always lived as uh, you would have us live as your holy people. Uh, Lord, we we might compare ourselves to others uh, and think, Uh, we are more holy than they and have reason to boast or we might compare ourselves to the world and and think we're not doing too bad but Lord when we gaze upon your perfect purity and holiness uh, we are forced to cry out just like Isaiah did woe is me Uh, for uh, we are uh, unclean people our lips have been unclean and we know that everything that proceeds from our from our lips proceeds from our unclean hearts and so we confess our sins we confess that our eyes have not looked upon things which are pure our our thoughts and the imaginations of our hearts have sometimes been impure Uh, our motivations even our our motivation to do good things have been tainted by sin we have said things or at least wanted to say things which were not upbuilding and a blessing to others but We use our words to tear them down. We confess that we've even thought things about you uh, which are not uh, good and righteous and true. And Lord, sometimes we just haven't given you a thought at all. And so we pray that you'd forgive us for our sin. And like Isaiah, we look to you for the cleansing that only you can supply. Just as you took away his uncleanness, take away ours. We look to our great high priest, Jesus Christ, and we 
We thank you that he's paid the debt of our sin and that there's no condemnation for us. Uh, we look to his sacrifice on the cross, knowing that his sacrifice is the one that can atone for all our, our sins. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, as we look to our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you would assure us that, that our guilt is taken away and that our sin is atoned for. And so we, we pray that as we uh, look um, ahead to another week, that you would strengthen us and bless us for your service. But that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us all that we need to fight the good fight of faith. Lord, we pray that we might be made more holy and that we might live as your holy people in the week ahead. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name as we say together, Amen. We're going to sing again now. We're going to use the words uh, of only uh, a holy God. We'll, we'll sing of the, the holiness of our God and, and also of the redeeming grace of our holy God. So let's uh, stand and sing together. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, 6, and uh, here we're going to read of some of God's instructions, uh, the Holy God's instructions for His uh, holy people, uh, and, the, and this morning when we get to Thessalonians, we're going to be thinking about God's uh, call upon uh, our lives to, to live sexually pure lives, and we, we have a similar theme come up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, and we'll pick up the reading at verse uh, 12. So 
1 Corinthians 6 from verse 12. Uh, and, and here, this, this first line seems to be a, a statement of the Corinthians that they were making, just one of these lines that they would use uh, as justification, uh, pretty much to do things that they shouldn't be doing. So they would, they would say, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with Him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. This is God's call upon us as uh, those who've been bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we honour Him uh, with our bodies. We're going to continue our worship now by bringing our, our gifts and offerings to the, to the Lord our God, and there's two collections this morning. Uh, the first is for the work of the church, and the second is for the work of AFES, uh, a student, uh, a ministry to students at the university here, and uh, we support uh, Keith Hill uh, through that ministry and the work that he does uh, with his team, um, including uh, our own Tim Vanderbosch. So let's, uh, let's bring our, our gifts and offerings to the Lord. Uh, and while we're um, giving, we're also going to be singing, um, God Himself is with us. So let's bring our gifts and lift our voices to sing.
Let's come to God in prayer. Will you pray with me, congregation? Let's pray. Lord, we've uh, just sung that um, in, in great and small that uh, we would uh, want to do what you uh, love most dearly, and so we, we pray that you would empower us in, in great and small uh, to do that which, which you love and, and that which, which pleases you. Uh, Lord, we, we know that uh, how we use uh, our, our money in, in generous and kingdom-focused ways pleases you, and so we pray that you would use the gifts that, that we have brought uh, to uh, build up the, the kingdom uh, of, of our, our Lord and our God. Uh, Lord, we pray for the work of AFES. We pray for Keith Hill. We pray for those who work with him. We, we pray for Tim Vandenbosch. And, and Lord, we uh, thank you for the opportunity that, um, that that group has to bear witness to you in the university. Thank you for their faithfulness to the, to the gospel. And Lord, we pray that as they uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ there uh, amongst the students, that there might be many uh, who are searching uh, and seeking, and you would put it in people's hearts to seek after you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless their work of discipleship, and uh, they might be able to uh, grow up those who are uh, mature in their, in their faith and, and can, can go and serve you and be a blessing to your church in many places. So we pray that you would uh, bless Keith and strengthen him for his work and his task that you've called him to there. Lord, we uh, thank you for your word and uh, we thank you that we can come to your word now and read it together. Lord, we uh, pray that your word would, would be that, that double-edged sword. We thank you that your word is, is powerful, that's living and active and we pray that it might do its work in us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name as we say together, Amen. So we're in Thessalonians again this morning, so... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to uh, read the first uh, eight, eight verses, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4. Let's hear God's words together. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this manner, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. So far the reading. If you're a serious Christian, I'm, I'm sure you've asked the question before, you know, what's God's will for me? You know, should I marry this particular person? Uh, should I take this particular job? Uh, should I go and live in, in that particular city and, and serve the Lord my God there? Uh, sometimes it's not very easy to determine God's will in these areas because we don't actually have a lot of instruction about them. But there is one aspect of God's will we can be absolutely crystal clear on. However old we are, whatever circumstances of life we might find ourselves in, you can know God's will for you today and indeed every single day, it's that you live a holy life. Uh, and in particular, that you live a holy life in terms of your sexual purity. Uh, Paul is starting a new section here, giving instruction to the Thessalonians and on how they ought to live out the Christian life. Uh, as we've seen, he spent quite a bit of time uh, reflecting uh, on his own ministry in Thessalon Thessalonica, and he's spoken about how they received the gospel and the gospel worked powerfully uh, in their midst. 
And he concluded with a prayer, and that was the end of chapter 3, a prayer for what was lacking in the church. And then he goes on to give instructions on the areas in which it appears the church was lacking, uh, where they had to grow. And you recall that this is a relatively new church plant, Paul wasn't there very long, so understandably, there's, there's lots of areas that they need to grow in. Uh, and the first of the areas he touches on is the sexual purity of the Christians. Now, why should Paul start here? Uh, we, we don't actually know what was going on in the church in Thessalonica uh, that elicited these instructions, uh, but it's hardly surprising uh, that he talks about this area because uh, the Greco-Roman world in which the Thessalonians lived was a very uh, sexually permissive and confused world. Uh, adultery and homosexual behaviour were no big deal. Uh, mistresses, uh, concubines and uh, house s servants that were used for sex were common. Uh, many pagan religious ceremonies involved sexual activity. Uh, if you think our world is sexually confused and broken, uh, you should take a little tour through the Greco-Roman world and you'll see many of the same things. And, and so it's in, this, in that place, in this sexually broken world, that God calls a people out of the darkness and by His grace, He, he calls them into the light and calls them to live you know, sexually pure lives. Now, you don't have to be uh, a cultural expert or a sociologist to, to know that you know, our age faces its own challenges in this area. Uh, one uh, author I appreciate uh, describes our age not as the, the secular age, but as the sexular age. We live in the sexular age. Our society has an unhealthy obsession with sexual intimacy and it has absolutely no clue whatsoever what it's meant to be used for. Our age says it's wrong to put any limits on sexual behaviour. The, the only limit is consent and the courts are still struggling to figure out what on earth that even means. Our age says sexual self-expression is good Sexual self-control, bad. Our age sees no more significance in engaging in intimacy with someone you've just met as having a cup of coffee with someone you've just met. Our age uh, says intimacy is the pathway to true and lasting happiness. And men and women in our world have never been more miserable as they've swallowed this lie hook, line and sinker. And our age, of course, puts pressure on Christians to conform to its views. And that's why we, we need these, uh, these instructions. Uh, we, we need these encouragements to live sexually pure lives in a sexually immoral world. So firstly, uh, we're going to see God's authority over our sexuality. God's authority over our sexuality. Uh, Paul starts this section in verse 1. Uh, by reminding the Thessalonians that previously he's given them instructions about how they ought to live in order to please God. So when he was with them, uh, clearly he spent some time explaining the implications of the gospel. This is how people who believe the gospel are meant to live, Christian ethics. Practical instructions come again here in the form of a letter, and so he's going to uh, talk um, uh, in, in this chapter in particular, in, in verses uh, 1 through 8, about pleasing God with uh, your sexuality, in verses 9 and 10, about pleasing God with church relationships, and then uh, pleasing God in practical living, in verse 11. And, of course, the, the good news is, uh, you don't have to guess what pleases God, do you? We, we don't have to guess what might please our God. And this is not like, you know, when you've got to get a, lift for a, a, a gift for a loved one, and you go to the mall and you've got no clue, and you're walking around in this trance-like state for a couple of hours, and at the end of it, you've, you've got nothing, and you know, what, what's going to please them? I've got no idea. Uh, here, we can be crystal clear, of course, on what pleases our God. We're not get, uh, left wondering. And the thing Paul draws our attention to here is that these instructions that he gives about sexual uh, purity come with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 2, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So, so Paul is, is saying, I, look, I, I taught you uh, about sexuality when I was there with you in Thessalonica, but they weren't my random thoughts and I had a few good suggestions on things. These are ethical instructions that, that come from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. 
Uh, Paul is just the ambassador, he's, he's just passing on the message from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an authoritative message, it's not, you know, take it or leave it, you know, whatever you want. Uh, one commentator put it like this, he said, the God-pleasing life is not presented as, uh, as some lofty ideal worth aspiring to, it comes to us as a demand, backed by the full authority of Christ our King. Now, this is quite important because today you will hear people argue that, you know, Jesus doesn't talk about you know, sexual behaviour X, He doesn't say it's wrong, so, so therefore, you know, it, it's okay. You know, I know Paul talks about it, but, but Jesus doesn't and, you know, we all know Jesus is at the heart of the, uh, the Christian faith and he's, he's far more loving than Paul, so we listen to Jesus. Uh, so, you know, living together, same-sex relationships, pornography, Jesus doesn't say anything about these things, so that must be okay. But, uh, of course, you can't set Paul against Jesus. Paul says, I'm coming and I'm speaking with the authority that Jesus has given me. Uh, you can't set Paul against Jesus. The ethical instructions that, that Paul brings are the ethical instructions from Jesus Christ. Just like all the ethical instructions in the Bible come with the authority of Christ. If you reject these commands, you're not rejecting Paul, you're rejecting Jesus. So, the, the church that hangs a pride flag, that has no issues with professing Christians cohabitating, that tolerates adultery and doesn't discipline its members, it's very serious because they're rejecting the authority of Jesus. I remember counselling once a young man who was living with his girlfriend and uh, talking to him about, you know, obviously uh, the ethical instructions that are uh, given uh, in, in the Scriptures uh, pertaining to sexual uh, intimacy and uh, he was quite upset with me and said, oh, I don't have to listen to the church, that's just the church. You'd, you'd say that, Andrew, because you're part of the church. And I said, you don't have to listen to the church, but you better listen to the Lord Jesus Christ because He's the one who has full authority over you and your body. You can reject my words, but you don't want to reject the words of Jesus Christ. Now, it couldn't be clearer from verse 8, could it? Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, but God. So, it's important that we listen to this authoritative word about our sexual purity. Uh, we, we are called to submit to Christ uh, and, and His words about our sexual lives. We're not called to submit to the words of our culture and its views of intimacy. And that leads to our second point, God's uh, intentions for our sexuality, God's intentions for our sexuality. In verse 3, Paul explicitly mentions what God's will for our Christian lives is. Uh, what's His will? Uh, His will is, is not that we be uh, happy or that we get to follow our desires wherever they might lead. His will is, it's very clear there, that you should be sanctified. And of course, another way to trans translate this is, is, is that uh, His will is that we should be made more holy, holy. And you'll recall that that's exactly what Paul was praying for at the end of chapter 3, that we'd be holy and blameless. That we'd be set apart from the world, so, so taken out of the world, set apart from the world, set apart to serve God. And in particular here, he's talking about uh, serving God with our sexuality. Sometimes we, we wonder what, what's God's plan for my life, what, what's the grand scheme He has for me, what should I do in retirement, what's God wanting for me as I work at home with the kids, cleaning up, more mess, what's God's will for me as a young person, there's so many options out there today, well, it couldn't be clearer. His grand scheme for you and me, if we are Christians, is that we grow in holiness that we grow in holiness, that's God's plan, it's God's plan for you every day and it's a, it's a beautiful plan. God's holiness is not some kind of unappealing, unattractive thing, holiness is a, is a beautiful thing uh, well, because God's plan is that we be conformed more and more to the likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ, the most, the only truly holy person who walked this earth. 
There's nothing negative about holiness and sanctification. It's a positive thing. Uh, the Christian approach to sexuality brings life and, and blessing. The world's approach leads to death and brokenness. And I think this is self-evident everywhere you look today. So, so I just want to encourage us, congregation, we've got something, as, as Christians, as, as those who be, believe the Christian ethic, we've got something beautiful to offer the world. We don't view people as commodities to be consumed. We view people as, as image bearers, to be honoured and respected. We don't see our, our sexual behaviour as the thing that defines us. What defines us is that we are dearly loved children of the living God. That's, that's the thing that defines us. We don't flit around from one part to the next, always looking for the next model that promises a better buzz, but, but we live lives of faithfulness to our, our spouses. And, and this is what makes us different. <clears throat> the world takes notice of this difference. It's actually one of the, the things that, that makes Christianity uh, beautiful. And in the first century, it's, it's one of the things that the, the pagan world noticed about the Christians. They were, they were different sexually. It's one of the things the world notices about us and there's a, there's a beauty in purity that is attractive. And, and of course, it's God's will that we be holy in these areas. Now, our third point this morning is God's practical instructions for our sexuality. God's practical instructions for our sexuality. Now, sometimes people complain, you know, the Bible tells me what to, what to do, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. Like having to, a garden sh- shed to build. Uh, but you're you're given all the pieces, but you don't have any instructions. It makes it uh, rather difficult. Well, you can't complain about that here. Uh, It it is clear uh, that God wants us to live sexually pure lives, and He tells us this is how you do it. He tells us to avoid sexual immorality in verse 3. And the term sexual immorality in the Greek, it's a very broad term. It refers to any uh, sexual activity outside the confines of of marriage. Uh, So, so any any lustful thoughts, uh, any... Uh, sinful heterosexual relationships, uh, all homosexual relationships. And, and then Paul gives uh, practical instructions about how to avoid sexual immorality. This, of course, is not everything the Bible teaches on this matter, uh, but there's two uh, things in particular Paul teaches. Firstly, he, he tells us to control our own bodies in ways that are holy and honourable. So, so he's talking about a self-control, in particular, controlling our, our natural sexual desires. Uh, that they're not to be given free reign to express themselves. And, and note the contrast that he gives here. This is contrasted with how the pagans live in passionate lust. And so, the, the pagans uh, give their desires free reign. They, they don't control them, they don't indulge them. They just go for it. And so, so for Paul, there are only two types of people in the world. There are pagans who do not know God, and there are those who are Christians, who who by God's grace have been saved, who know God, who know the power of God at work in their lives. And if you're a Christian, you're not meant to act like a pagan. You're not meant to give free reign to your passions and desires. Now, I don't know if it's clear to you or not, but, but we live in the age... Uh, in which every movie and just about every cultural message actually reinforces the pagan way of living. I'll give you some statements that demonstrate this. Uh, let's, let's see if you can recognise some of these statements. I'm sure you can. If it feels good, do it. You be you, or you do you. Just follow your heart. That's the way you were born, Born that way, baby, how could it be wrong? I'm sure you can all recognise these statements, but, but do you actually recognise the theology that these statements are teaching us? It's Pagan Theology 101, because they're all teaching the same thing. You have passions and desires in your heart, and you've just got to let them out. Let them rip. Uh, go for it. You be you wherever they lead, and don't let anyone at all tell you to control them, or suppress them or put them to death even but the bible teaches of course we're to control ourselves now <clears throat> we teach kids this all the time don't we with with their words we, we tell them don't say whatever pops into your little head some things shouldn't be said we've got got to control our tongues and why why would it be different with our bodies 
we've got to control our, our bodies as well. And of course, we, we know uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, these, these fruits of the Spirit are contrasted with the works of the flesh in the book of Galatians. Uh, and in Galatians, uh, some of the works of the flesh are sexual immorality and impurity. That the, the, the exact same words that are, that are mentioned here. So, so pleasing God involves developing self-control. The other practical help is found in verse 6, uh, where we're, we're told not to wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister in this matter. And again, what Paul says here is so countercultural. We're told today that a little bit of sexual immorality doesn't hurt anyone. You know? As long as there's two consenting adults, it's just their business and, and, uh, and it doesn't hurt anyone else. And along comes the Apostle Paul with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, that is absolute garbage. Your sexual cho- choices do affect other people. And in particular, he wants us to know that our sexual behaviour can affect our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And you and I both know uh, that if an instance of adultery takes place in the midst of the church, there's, there's, a, there's a tidal wave of damage that it, that it does. It damages everyone in the church. It, it's not just two consenting adults. There's a whole group of spiritual brothers and sisters who get hurt and damaged by it. Uh, and, and of course, it's the same in, in, in every other area of sexual behaviour. The husband suffers if their wife is unfaithful, a wife suffers if their husband is addicted to pornography, a prospective spouse is hurt if his or her, her future spouse's purity is stained. Uh, that's not to say that these sins can't be forgiven, but, th- but the point that Paul is making here is that uh, sexual immorality actually hurts other people, it hurts brothers and sisters, it hurts those in the church. So, so Paul wants us to remember, he wants you to remember that if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you are brothers and si- we're a family, we're, we're brothers and sisters in the faith, we belong to the same family and in a healthy family, you don't want your brother or sister get, to get hurt, do you? Boys, if you've, if you've got a sister, uh, you don't want some guy to punch him in the face uh, and girls, if you've, you've got brothers, you don't want some girl to scratch his eyes out. We don't want our family members to be hurt. And so Paul is saying here, to sin sexually with a brother or sister is to hurt them. It's like punching them in the face. It's like scratching their eyes out through sexual indiscretion. And and so Paul is saying, we need to treat each other with with sexual purity. It's quite interesting, uh, actually, I find this fascinating. Um, How does Paul help us, uh, you know, uh, become sexually pure people, um, he takes us to doctrine and he takes us to one of the most surprising doctrines uh, you, you can imagine, he takes us to the communion of saints and he, and he reminds us we're, we're family uh, and so let's live as family and, and seek not to wrong each other in this way. Our final point this morning is God's motivations for our sexual purity, God's motivations for our sexual purity. I think um, none of us are under any illusion that in the culture in which we live, uh, pleasing God in these ways is is not all that easy. So thankfully, uh, God gives us some motivations here to be sexually pure. There's the negative motivator in verse 6, and the negative motivator there is actually the threat of punishment. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins. It's a really poor translation, actually. Uh, the, The text literally says, the Lord is an avenger. The Lord is an avenger, and we're not meant to be thinking of Captain America and, uh, and those folks. Uh, avenger is, is a biblical word that refers to the person who comes uh, and avenges uh, an injustice by punishing the person who perpetrated it. So this is actually a threat of uh, future punishment for wrongdoing. To persist in sexual immorality uh, without repentance makes men and women liable of a fearsome judgment. Uh, this is taught elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, we read in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, to be clear, this is not saying sexual sin cannot be forgiven. Of course, sexual sin can be forgiven. Praise God. To the church in Corinth, after these kind of words of warning, we, we read straight after that, this, this glorious verse, one of the most beautiful verses in Corinthians. Uh, to sexual sinners, Paul writes, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's the gospel, isn't it? God takes people out of sexual sin and cleanses them. The point is not that Christians don't struggle with sexual sin. Uh, if, if that were true, why all these instructions about living sexually pure lives? We, we wouldn't need them. Now, the point is that unrepentant sexual sin is a most serious matter. It's not that it just hurts other people, hurts other brothers and sisters. It, it puts your relationship with God in jeopardy. It's a matter of life and death, of heaven and hell. That's what's at stake here. God will judge those who persist in sexual sin without seeking Him for forgiveness and grace to repent. So, I hope you see that this kind of just blows out of the water that uh, the, the modern notion that churches need to be inclusive in this area. God is not inclusive in this area. To be sure, God's kingdom does include all those who are forgiven for sexual sin. But his kingdom does not include those who will not repent of their sexual sin. How, how ridiculous it is that we hear people today say, you know, I'm a Christian, I've been made holy, you know, I know that God's will is my holiness, but I have no intention of being holy. I mean, it's like saying I'm a vegetarian. I have bacon and eggs for breakfast, chicken pie for lunch and a T-bone for dinner. You're not a very a vegetarian if you ignore the very instructions that constitute what it means to be a vegetarian. And you, you can't call yourself a Christian if you refuse to follow the instructions of the one who determines what Christianity actually is. Now, the second motivation is that this sexually uh, pure life is, is what, uh, as Christians, we've been called to. You see, the wonderful news of the gospel is not just that we've been forgiven, that we've been justified and that we're forever right with God, no matter what we've done, that we've been brought into His family. The, the wonderful news of the gospel is that, that we've brought, been brought out of our pagan lives and we've been brought into a, a new life, a new life of serving God and living for Him, a new life of, of holiness. We're not... So, we've been saved to be holy. We haven't been saved by our holiness. Our holiness is not going to save anyone. It's not our pure hearts and righteous sexual behaviour that get us into heaven. Otherwise, none would be saved. But we're actually be, we're saved to be holy. This is one of the reasons why God has saved us. This is what God calls us to. And there's this wonderful encouragement in the, in the text here, uh, because the word call is one of those special words in Scripture. Uh, it actually means uh, that the call produces an effect. So I think parents understand you can you can call call your kids. You know, come here, come here, Johnny, uh, and and the call might produce an effect. They might come, but they might not. Uh, they might ignore you. Uh, they might go off. They they might not hear you. But when God calls, and this is the encouragement here, when God calls, the call is always heeded. Because God's call hasn't it the power to do what He's calling you to do. It's, an, it, it's what, the, what, what theologians call an effectual call. God's call is effectual. And that's what it is here. God's call to sexual purity to Christians is an effectual call. He's, he's not just summoning us to do something, He's exercising His power in us to get it done. And, and that's good news that good news for, for anyone battling against sexual sin? Purity is what God has called us to, and He has the power to do it in us. So, take heart, brothers and sisters. Now, one final motivation is there in verse 8, uh, and there in verse 8, where we're told, God gives you His Holy Spirit. Uh, so, 
here again, uh, we're reminded of that wonderful truth uh, that, that God uh, gives us, the, the third person of the Trinity. Uh, God, the Spirit, is often called the Spirit of life in the Old Testament, uh, but the Spirit in the New Testament is most often called the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's to draw our attention to His work. His work is to make people uh, holy. This is the Spirit who indwells each Christian. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not just in the super-spiritual, He's not just in the missionaries, He's not just in the mature Christians, He's in every Christian. He's, he's moved into our hearts. And, and, and what kind of home does He, does he want to create in our, in our lives and in our hearts? He wants to create an, an aroma of holiness in every single room uh, in which our hearts consist of. A holy home, He's there to help us in our weakness to live holy lives. And this again is an encouragement, of course, to, for us to, to live holy lives. We, we don't do it in our own strength. Uh, we have the Spirit who indwells us. So what we, what we have uh, here in this text is a, is a wonderful bit of Trinitarian theology. The triune God has given us all we need to live these holy lives. Uh, we have Jesus' voice. His, his voice of, of, of warning, uh, warning us against the danger of ignoring Him, uh, His voice calling us to come and bow beneath His kingship. We have the, the voice of our Father calling us to holiness and His call will affect that which He purposes it to do. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to put strength in every stride to live lives of sexual purity. So here is God's will for you your sexual purity. And, and along with His will, uh, this is the encouragement, isn't it? He gives us every provision that we need to live this out. So, let us live then uh, those sexually pure lives He's called us to and let us seek to please God in this area. Amen. We're going to sing together a song which reflects on our desire to be um, God's uh, holy people. Uh, so, we're going to sing... Uh, refiner's fire and uh, we'll, we'll stand to sing together. Take a seat and let's uh, come to the Lord our God in prayer.
you pray with me? Lord our God, we come to give you thanks for, for all your good gifts to us. And we do thank you for the gift of sexual intimacy, a gift of your goodness and kindness and generosity and creativity. And Lord, we want to be good stewards of this gift. And uh, so we, we come to you and, and we pray that we might uh, use this gift in the way that you've intended. Lord, we pray for those who are married in our midst. Give married couples the desire to cherish and honour and care for each other in every area of their relationship. Lord, we, we pray that your gospel might free us not to seek our own interests, but the interests of our spouses in this area of intimacy as well. Lord, we know that marriage does not free people from sexual sin, so we pray that by your grace you would give all married couples the, the grace of forgiveness for the misuse or disuse of this gift and grace to keep the marriage bed pure. Lord our God, we uh, want to pray this morning also for uh, Christian and Erica as Erica head back to the, heads back to the States to obtain a visa. We pray that you would uh, grant her success and that she'd be able to return again soon and we, we pray that you would sustain them and give them strength while they're apart. Lord, we pray for those who are single in our midst. Uh, Lord, we pray for our single folk that they would see through the lie of our culture that, that says that intimacy is the path to true fulfillment. We, we pray that they might see that our truest fulfillment comes in relationship with you. Lord, we pray for those who are addicted to pornography or other expressions of broken sexuality. We ask that you would grant them the grace of repentance and the hope that through the power of the gospel, a change is possible. Lord, give uh, grace and patience um, to, to, to those who walk alongside those struggling in this way. And Lord, we pray for anyone who is struggling secretly in this area. We pray that they might bring their sin into the light and that they might be able to, to talk to somebody and ask them for, for help. Lord, we pray for those who've been hurt by sexual sin or who have a deep sense of shame over their sexual sin. We thank you for the good news of a saviour who, who not only forgives our sin, but one who covers all our shame and, and clothes us in, in the purity of his own righteousness. We thank you for a saviour who, who sees us as his beautiful bride, despite what we've done or what's been done to us. Lord, we pray that Jesus would bring his healing heart and hand to bear upon those who are broken by sexual sin. Lord, um, the psalmist asked, how can a young man keep his way pure? Uh, by living according to your word. And so we pray for our young men, that our young men might be men of your word, that you would guard them from the, the foolish sins of youth, and that they would find uh, great pleasure in you and in the living waters that, that Jesus Christ offers. Lord, this world tells us that purity is a bad thing, and uh, we pray that purity might be a, a virtue that is cherished and rejoiced in, and we, we pray for our young girls and ladies, that they would grow in purity of life and thought, that they would adorn themselves in spiritual beauty. Lord, we Pray for those who are fighting against the evils of uh, human trafficking. Lord, we pray for the police in different jurisdictions around the world. We pray that you would give them skill and success in bringing to justice those who commit these crimes. Lord, we pray for international justice mission, that you would use them to bring people out of slavery and use them to shed your light abroad. Lord, we, we pray for those who commit such crimes. Lord, we pray that you would, you would humble their hearts and call them to repentance. But if they do not repent, Lord, we pray that you would oppose them and that the Lord Jesus would exercise his rule and judgment upon them. Lord God, we, we know that your gift of, of physical intimacy is designed to point us to the, to the great intimacy that, that we all need. And that is to to know true intimacy and, 
and fellowship with you, that the true and the, the living God. And so we, we pray uh, that we might know you better, uh, that we might uh, enjoy you more and more, Lord God, and that we might find our, our great satisfaction in walking with you uh, day by day. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name as we say together, Amen. We're going to sing again now uh, a psalm which uh, speaks of just walking with the Lord and enjoying intimacy with Him. O uh, Lord, my God, most earnestly I seek Your holy face. So let's stand and sing, uh, and please remain standing after we've sung. closing song this morning uh, will be Majesty and I invite you after the service to come out and join us for a cup of tea or coffee and I understand there's some other nice goodies out there for us to, to feast on so let's continue to, to fellowship together after the service. But now in faith receive God's blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who calls us, he is faithful and he will do it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.